We'll turn your Bibles, if you would, to Genesis chapter number 35. Genesis 35, as we continue, as we have looked at the life now of Joseph. A familiar Bible character. You'll know Joseph by his coat of many colors. We'll probably touch on that just a little bit today. Joseph, a familiar Bible character, one that is often talked about in Sunday school with the children. Joseph, he went into captivity, he was sold into slavery. Joseph, he lived in Potiphar's and served in Potiphar's house. And eventually Joseph ended up being the second in command under Pharaoh. What a tremendous honor that this young Hebrew, that God bestowed upon this young Hebrew. I don't know about you, but sometimes... When you're learning about Bible characters, sometimes we put them in this special box and put them on a pedestal. I could never act that way. I could never be that way. I can't relate to them in any way, shape, or form. There's no way that, that I could in, in any way be as faithful as this Bible character or as, as, of a, as much character and I look at the life of Joseph, and I see at the end of the story, I see a man of faithfulness. I see a man of character. I see a man of devotion. A man who is about the business of his God. He says, in the sense of our theme this year, Joseph says, I believe God in that sense. And he says it with his life. But as I was studying the character of Joseph, I realized some things, some truths from God's Word that Joseph did these things in spite of circumstances in his life. You know that we all have situations in our life that we would not choose. All of us, we would have situations that we say, you know what, I would rather take the exit on this particular situation. Sometimes it's health. Sometimes we're going through a, a great trial and turmoil and it's health related. Sometimes it's a situation of our own making and sometimes it's a situation that has fallen upon us. Last week we looked at Joseph's family. If you, didn't, if, if you weren't here last Sunday or didn't hear the message last Sunday, go back and listen to it. Joseph came from a dysfunctional family. Bitterness and fighting and problems all throughout his family. And Joseph, in spite of that, still pleased God. Still pleased God. This morning, with God's help, I'm looking at another aspect of it in spite of in Joseph's life. As I was studying the life of Joseph, there's a little portion of Scripture that you can almost miss in your Bible reading. You can almost miss in the, in the account of Joseph. You can almost miss this. And, and as I was studying, the Lord seemed to bring this to my mind in this in spite of a series. That we can still believe God in spite of. Joseph didn't make an excuse in spite of. And sometimes that's what we do. Lord, I would serve you if you'd done this differently. Lord, I would be faithful to you if this were different. There's a little section of Scripture in Genesis chapter 35 that you can almost miss. And maybe sometimes we do miss. In the life of Joseph. Genesis 35, beginning verse number 16. We're talking about the travels of his family and they, that is Jacob and his wives and children, journeyed from Bethel. And there was but a little way to come to Ephrath. And Rachel travailed and she had hard labor. Now, this was a, was a particularly hard labor. I don't know of many labors for women that, is, that are not hard. There's always one, it seems like, in every crowd. Right, ladies? And sometimes we'll ask those questions, how was your birth? And some ladies like, oh, you know, I had this birth in 13 seconds and I feel great. Went home the next day. Everyone else says, no, I was there for 14 weeks in labor. <laughs> we have some... Some ladies here who are, are with child, Miss Jackie being one of them, and I, I warned her about some of you. Some of you ladies want to relive your hard labor with our new mothers, expectant mothers. Oh, it's going to be horrible. I barely survived. She'll figure it out. Don't be the, 
don't be that person. All right, don't be that person. Would you would you encourage? All right, but but yes, I mean that is hard labor, and uh, I admire my wife, and she's a wonderful lady. That's boy, and uh, men we couldn't do that. Men we could not do that. You know what? I'm happy to I'm happy to sign that off to the ladies. All right, I'm happy to say that. All right, some of you men are idiots. Oh, it can't be that hard. You're an idiot. All right, you're a fool. <laughs> All right, I'm happy, honey. You can win the prize. All right, that's, that's a, okay. But she was in hard labor. God had said that labor, childbearing, would be hard ever since the curse, but this was particularly difficult. There were some, apparently, some complications in this hard labor. It wasn't just a normal birth. It wasn't just a normal situation. It wasn't just a normal, run-of-the-mill labor. She was with travail and in hard labor, the Bible says. 17, verse 17 of Genesis 35, And it came to pass, when she was in hard labor, that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar upon her grave, that is the pillar of Rachel's grave, unto this day. Lord, I thank you for this time, and Lord, I pray that you would guide us. Lord, I pray that your spirit would be evident among us this morning. Lord, I ask for your help for myself this morning. Lord, I need you. Help me to say those things that would be profitable and helpful to your word. Lord, if there's something that I have down in my notes or my mind to say that would not be beneficial, Lord, strike it from my mind and let me just not even look at it in my notes. Lord, I pray that as we listen to your word this morning, your spirit would speak to us. Lord, I pray that if there's someone here with a burden and need, that they would be encouraged. Lord, I ask that there's someone here who's never trusted you as their savior that they would not leave today without trusting you. Lord, we love you. We thank you for what you're doing here and all that you've done. We'll give you the praise and the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to spend time this morning pointing out the fact that Joseph was faithful in spite of great tragedy. This little section, just a few verses in the account of Joseph. There are chapters shown to the to to the time of Joseph's life that we'll look at when he's in captivity, when he's in uh, in Potiphar's house, when he's in the prison, when he's actually now dishing out and distributing the goods. And here you can almost miss these five verses, these five small verses in Genesis chapter 35. And while we could quickly read through these five verses, and you can bypass them in your Bible reading, almost. Don't for a moment think that these verses did not affect Joseph in his life. For Joseph lost his mother. Sometimes in our life, we face great tragedy. You ever face great tragedy? Great loss? You ever hit something hard? I'm not talking about a sporting event loss. You'll watch sometimes athletes and professional athletes, they lose and they're crying. Now, those are sorrowful, I'm sure sad, emotional things. I'm not the guy who says, boys never cry. I think that's foolishness as well. What I do instruct my sons is there are some things that are worth crying about and other things that are not worth crying about. And a sporting event is not one of those things. All right, that's not one of those things. There are other things. Your ice cream drops on the ground. No, I jest, of course. There's some things, but other things, not so much. We can't live long in this world and at least not identify that at times there are great tragedies, great losses in life. Can we not? Even if we've not necessarily experienced it, though I would dare say most of us have in one way, shape, or form, we cannot help but at least look around and see that around us there are tragedy, there is loss. We see responses to those things. 
and not always the correct response. I look at the life of Joseph and almost as a statement, almost as just a, a sub note, almost as just a little product of what's going on. It says, and during this time, Joseph had a brother. His name was Benjamin. He was renamed Benjamin by his father, but his mother passed. What if you're like Joseph? You see, if we're not careful, we can miss entirely God's hand in the sight of tragedy. We can miss what God wants to do in the face of great loss. Now, I did not know this when I began to study this passage, but there are some people, I just want to say this so in case you're one of these people, who believe that Rachel's mother died after Joseph was sold into slavery. All I did was read a little bit further in my Bible and found out that that was not the case. In fact, we won't talk about it today, but if you go to Genesis chapter 45, when the boys, when his brothers, the boys, finally come to, uh, come to Egypt, Joseph never once asks about his mother. He just asks about his father repeatedly. So either A, she'd already passed, or B, he didn't love his mother. Help me here. What they'll use sometimes is the dream of Joseph. They'll say, well, Jacob said, your mother and I bowing down and easy. I think that was referring to his stepmother, Leah. And so I did not know that some people didn't think that, but as I read my Bible, it's clear, it's very clear from Scripture and some other passages as well, that, that Joseph lost his mother while he was still there. Joseph woke up the next morning without a mother. Joseph had some life experiences without his mother, a great loss, and he was under 17 years old. Genesis chapter 37 tells us that. So somewhere in, in the time that he was born, a child of 17, his mother passed. We don't know exactly when that happened. We just know there's some gap in there. Well, what I'm trying to say is that Joseph, as a young man, experienced tremendous loss and tremendous tragedy. And I know, I'm convinced, and partly from personal experience, I know that some of us can identify with that. They would say, you know what? I know, I understand what Joseph was feeling like. And maybe you're here today going through some type of loss and some type of tragedy. Sometimes when people travel through this path, they discontinue, they quit on life. They quit on their obligations. They quit on their duties. They quit caring about life. Maybe you've seen someone in this situation who has went through a tremendous loss or a, a hard tragedy. And instead of responding correctly, they, they shut down. They shut down. They stop doing the things that they ought to be doing. Sometimes they doubt. Why would God allow this to happen? And don't for a moment think that Joseph was just some special, supernatural person. He was flesh and blood like you and me, used greatly by God, but he wasn't supernatural. He didn't have anything that we don't have as well. Don't think that some of those emotions that maybe you felt or you've seen someone else feel that, that maybe Joseph would not have felt that, that Joseph was just immune to that because he's in the Bible or that Joseph couldn't be identified with that because he's listed in the Bible. And that's what we do. We put Joseph up on this pedestal like we should because he was faithful to God. But don't think that those thoughts maybe never crossed his mind, that Joseph just didn't care. Sometimes when people hit a great tragedy, they begin to doubt they begin to doubt God. God, how could you allow this to happen in my life? Are you not good? Are you not powerful? Could you not have stopped this? All rhetorical questions. Because we know God to be good. The Bible says He is a good God. We know that God is powerful. The Bible tells us that He is. We know that God can do anything He wants to do. He's God. He's not bound but by Himself. In fact, the Bible says because that God could not swear, He could not make a commitment greater than Himself. He promised by Himself. 
You know, sometimes little kids, I pinky swear. All right? And it's supposed to mean that I'm really, really, really serious now. God says the greatest thing that I can make a commitment by is me. God is that powerful. And yet sometimes in these tragedy, sometimes in these loss, we're guilty of these thoughts of doubt. God, how could you let this happen? And maybe not even to the degree of losing someone close like a mother, but even in our tragedy, like small things in our life, we say that, don't we? Oh, God, how could you allow that to happen? How could you allow that problem at my house? How could you allow this problem at my job? Don't you know? And, and our minds begin to wander. Your mind ever wanders? Why does it usually wander down the wrong path? All right? It never wanders like, wow, this is going to be a blessing. This must be a blessing in disguise. This is going to be phenomenal. God's going to just going to increase my ministry, and I can't wait to see how much uh, blessings God will just dump on my life. No, it's like, oh no. Everything's over now. Life is done. Life is done. I'm going to lose my house, and my family won't be taken care of. And the world is coming to an end. It'll all burn up tomorrow. That's where our mind goes. End of the world. We begin to doubt God. How could you allow this to happen? How could you do this? I thought you were good. I thought you loved people. Somehow thinking that because God is love, that zero tragedy will come into our life. Do you think that God was surprised by the death of Rachel? I don't think so at all. Yet in these times, in these tragic moments, that, that if we're not careful, our minds go the wrong direction. I read about a man who was called after Princess Diana was killed in an automobile, automobile accident. He's a man who is a Christian. And they called him and asked him, they said, we want you to explain how God could possibly allow such a terrible accident. Man responded, he said, he said, without even thinking, I, I said this, uh, could it possibly have been the drunk driver who was traveling 90 miles an hour? Man went on to say that I begin to dig and found ways that God gets blamed for things. You see, as we examine human suffering in the Bible, there are times that God will allow something, but if we're not careful, we ask the wrong questions. God, are you not good? God, why did you allow this happen? Rather than, God, what are you going to accomplish in this? You see, I, I see this in the story that Joseph had an in spite of moment. And sometimes people, they become, uh, they discontinue, they doubt, or sometimes they become distraught. Maybe you've seen people, or yourself, who in spite of a tragedy become very angry. Become, here's the Bible word, bitter. Heard that word before? Get mad at everybody, everyone and everything, including God. Well, that's it. If that's how God's going to treat me, then that's the last day I will serve Him. I don't see that from the life of Joseph. I don't see that later on in his life. They become bitter. They become angry. They say that a rattlesnake, if you corner it, can become so angry that it will bite itself. Thereby harming itself. And that's what bitterness does to you and me. Puts us in a corner where we bite ourselves. We think we're harming others, but the true deeper harm is to ourselves. Sometimes they become depressed. Wonder of Joseph, somewhere as a young man, perhaps 12, perhaps 13, perhaps even 15 years old, I wonder if he walked his path. There's a story told about a man, a Midwestern lawyer, who suffered from such deep depression that his friends thought it best to keep all the knives and razors out of his reach. This man questioned his life's calling and even the prudence of attempting to follow it through. During this time, this man wrote these words, I am now the most miserable man living. Whether I shall ever be better, I cannot tell. I am awfully forebode, I shall not. But somehow, somewhere, Abraham Lincoln 
receive the encouragement that he needed. You see, sometimes in these tragedy, in these tragic moments, in this loss, we have people who will doubt, who will discontinue, who become depressed. With this discontent and dispute. But I don't see that from the life of Joseph. If I, I'd like you to, if you would, to turn to Genesis chapter 37. When we now pick back up on the story of Joseph, we have kind of Genesis chapter 35, and we have this, this tragic, it would seem a tragic circumstance by all human accounts, a great loss by all of, of our metrics. We would say, Joseph, you know what? You're probably not going to do well in life, Joseph. You know, this is such a terrible thing. Yet we come to Genesis chapter 37, and we're brought back into the life of Joseph. We're going to see now where Joseph is at now that he's exactly 17 years old. In verse 1, And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob, Joseph, being 17 years old. There's a little comma there. Before you read those next words, don't jump ahead. What would you predict Joseph would be doing? Sitting at home. Out of the will of God, anger, bitterness, depression, all these things that could be natural responses, giving up on life, not wanting to speak to anybody, but yet that's not what the Bible says. Look, Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilham, with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought unto his father their evil reports. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was a son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not possibly or could not speak peaceably unto him. I'm going to give you some thoughts this morning about the life of Joseph in the spite of situation just a few moments. We come back into the life of Joseph and we see this great tragedy. We don't know all that he traveled through. And I'm glad the Bible doesn't give us every single step. Because maybe we'd use that as an excuse, like we would be apt to do. Oh, well, Joseph said that, so I can say that. Joseph thought that, so I can think that. But we come back into the life of Joseph, and we see something that I think is powerful. Joseph remained faithful. He remained faithful. He's there in the Bible, and he's feeding his father's flock with his brethren. You know what he's doing? He was doing what he was supposed to be doing. He was doing what he was expected to be doing. If you continue on in this chapter, we won't now take the time to do that. You'll find that his father asked him a question, and he says, Here am I. Sign me up. I'll do it. We see Joseph give a response to his father. and goes, I'm, I'm in. I'll do it. I see in the life of Joseph a response that I think can be a help to us. If you want to be faithful, you have to be faithful. We look at the end of the life of Joseph and say, boy, you know what? I wouldn't mind being second in command in the greatest kingdom at that time. I wouldn't mind wielding that power sometimes. What would you do with that power? I know what I would do. Make my own road. And no one's allowed on my road except for me. No slow drivers on my road. Yes, I would. I'd make my own line at the grocery store. Nobody checking out slow in front of me at the grocery store. And no more self-checkout in my line. Who invented self-checkout? All right, it wasn't the Lord, that's for sure. We look at the end of life of Joseph and say, man, look at him. He's got it all at the end. He's got his family back. He's got now the riches and the land and the power. Boy, I wouldn't mind having those blessings in my life. Joseph, at the end of his life, didn't have need of anything. He had everything that he, he would humanly say he needed. And we want the end of the story. We want that faithfulness at the end. But I'll tell you this, if you want to be faithful, then you have to be faithful right now. You see, Joseph's response didn't just show up one day 30 and 40 years later. I believe it started right here where Joseph began to feed the flock of his brethren. He began to get back out there, began to do what he was supposed to be doing, just the actions that was expected of him. When his father asked, he responded. When he was supposed to be out there, he was out there. And he told the truth. He had to bring the evil report of his brothers. And I see the faithfulness. Say, well, Pastor, what, is, what does faithfulness look, faithfulness look like for me? 
Well, God's called us to different walks. I'm called to be a husband. I'm called to be a dad. And I'm called to be a man of God. What do I do to be faithful? Those things God's called me to do. I, tomorrow, get up, put my shoes on. I come to work. I come with the right spirit, with the Lord's help. I try to have a good attitude. I try to lead my family the right way. I want to be faithful in what God has called me to do. And it's not glamorous necessarily. It's not, it's not just, wow, this all glitter and everything, but it's, it's one step at a time. Feeding the flock. Get back out there with the filthy, dirty sheep. You ever uh, have a bad attitude on your way to work? You ever? Or is every day just like, yeah, I can't wait. Monday morning, tomorrow. Now, some of you are retired. We had a retired neighbor for years, and I'd come home, he'd be on the front porch. Pop, pop, we'd call him good man. I said, pop, pop, how was today? And I loved his retired phrase, every day is a holiday. <laughs> but most of us aren't retired yet. Some of you are students. Tomorrow's Monday morning. Some of you have tests this week. You know what we, or I have to do? You know what? I'm not going to be faithful. You see, I see Joseph was out there feeding his flock. He was faithful. And when no one else sees it, God sees it. God sees what's going on. Be faithful. Joseph was faithful. If you want to be faithful, then be faithful. Feeding the flock with his brethren. Oh, listen, you know, we can, we can be in the right place and to be in the wrong place. The young, y- young man who didn't want to stand up when his teacher asked him to stand up. Stand up, son, give the answer. He responded, I may be standing up on the outside, but I'm sitting down on the inside. That's how we are sometimes. Is it not? Oh, on the outside I'm faithful, but not on the inside. See, Joseph being faithful. When you face great tragedy, with God's help, you can be faithful. But I see something else in this passage, something that, that caught my attention that, that is a little bit negative, but there's a, another side to it. If you look at those verses in Genesis chapter 37 again, we notice that Joseph got a coat of many care, of colors because his father, Israel, loved Joseph. Now listen, this is not the way you ought to run a family. All right? This is not this is not the correct way. This is not a pattern. You should not have favoritism like this in your family. Okay? But Israel loved Joseph. He loved him. When I was studying this out, what caught me is that when the brothers come back, and I mentioned this briefly in Genesis chapter 45. In Genesis chapter 45, the brothers are finally talking to Joseph. Joseph has revealed himself. And four times in that passage, he says, Does my father yet live? Go up, tell my father. Tell my father this. And to his father, he sent all these things. You see, Joseph was also the recipient of some tremendous love. If I can't say it this way, the love of a father. The love of a father. And oh, my friend... I'm here to tell you today that you and I have the love of a father in our life. Now, my God doesn't play favorites like Israel did with Joseph, but you and I are recipients of the love of the father. And the hand of God can do things in our life that we can never possibly imagine. I wonder if the love of the father helped him through that time. I wonder if the love of the father it will help us through our time I read a story. It was in 1818 in France. Or 18, I'm sorry. And Louise, a boy of nine, was sitting in his father's workshop. The father was a harness maker. And the boy loved to watch his father work the leather. Someday, father, said Louis, I want to be a harness maker just like you. Why not start now, said the father. He took a piece of leather and drew a design on it. Now, my son, take the hole puncher and a hammer and follow this design. But be careful that you don't hit it too hard or don't hit your hand. Excited, the story goes, the boy began to work. But when he hit the hole puncher, it flew out of his hand and it pierced his eye. He lost the sight of that eye immediately. And later... 
the second I followed. And now Lewis was totally blind. It was a few years later that Lewis was sitting in the family garden when a friend handed him a pine cone. And as he ran his sensitive fingers over the cone, an idea came to him. He began to get excited. And he began to create an alphabet off what he felt. And thus Lewis Braille opened up a whole new world for the blind all because of an accident. You see, when God gets involved in your life and my life, He takes those accidents, those tragedies, and does something powerful, something great. You may not see it today, I may not see it today, but remain faithful because we have the love of the Father in our life. The love of God who loves us. The Bible says, Behold, what manner of love hath the Father bestowed upon us that we can be called the children of God, the sons of God. Listen, we have the love of the Father, and we can be faithful to the love of the Father and faithful to Him. And my friend, if you're here today, and you have it in spite of a tragedy in your life, and I dare say we can identify with that, it's hard sometimes. The easy route is to doubt, to question, to wonder, to accuse, to become bitter, to, like that rattlesnake, bite ourselves. The right response is faithfulness. And Joseph through faithfulness, honored the Lord. And of his life, and of his life, we see his perspective. And I think in Genesis chapter 50, the verse that he gives to his brother, what he says to his brothers, encompasses his entire life where he said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. If I could sum up Joseph's life, it was, it was meant for evil. And every step of the way, this looked bad. My family looked bad. The loss of my mother looked bad. The next few weeks, we'll look at the other tragedies or other things that he faced. But through it all, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. You want to in spite of a moment in your life? Stay faithful to the Lord. Lord, I thank you for loving us. Lord, I don't know what loss or tragedy we may be facing today. Lord, I know that you love us. And Lord, if we can still be faithful to you. I wonder this morning, with our heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here, and I wonder if you have faced or are facing a tremendous tragedy or loss in your life. It may not be to the same level as Joseph faced with losing his mother, but no less hurtful or painful. I wonder if you've been tempted to, to get off on the wrong path question become better this morning can I encourage you to stay faithful to get out and feed the flock with the brethren that's the right response I wonder who would say pastor would you pray for me this morning as you spoke God spoke to me and I've been facing a difficult situation and I want to remain faithful in my life would you pray for me when you pray this morning who would say that's me pastor as you spoke God spoke to me amen Amen. 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 Hands all over. As you spoke, God spoke to me. Facing something difficult. Amen. I want to remain faithful. Amen. Who else? Amen. Who else? I wonder if you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, you talked about trusting Jesus Christ as, as their Savior. I've never trusted Him. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? I, did, I don't know that if I died today I'd go to heaven, but I'd like to know. And I'll call no more attention to you than I did anyone else besides acknowledge it. I wonder who would say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm saved. Would you pray for me? I'd like to be sure. Just slip your hand up, slip back down. The Bible says now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Lord, you've seen these hands. You know the heart, Lord. You know what the circumstances what we may be going through. Lord, I pray you'd help us to remain faithful. Lord, help those who acknowledge the raising of hands that you've touched their heart. Lord, I can't begin to know all the hurt and heartache, but you do. Lord, may we, in this tragedy, in spite of, remain faithful to you. Lord, bless the invitation. And Lord, if there's someone here online who's never trusted you, Lord, would they trust you today in Jesus' name?